What's the best marketing company to use instead of these fake promotional companies that use bots? I just like taught myself music production was the best thing. I was absolutely horrible and I got better. I made a song that sounds suspiciously like Nickelback. What's your opinion on artist freedom using YouTube type beats? YouTube type beats, here's the thing, here's the thing. Great talks guy, but my OCD keeps distracting me whenever you guys say Udio instead of Udio. Now, I have seen so many content creators say Udio. I actually haven't heard really anybody say Udio, but I did reach out to the people of Udio and I specifically asked them. I said, uh, you know, are you pronounced Udio or Udio? It, there's quite the debate on this. And they actually responded to me and they said, hi there. We're not super strict on it, but technically our CEO says Udio. We're okay with people saying it however they want for now, at least. So, you know, it is Udio. It's going to take some training for me to say that, but that is straight from Udio themselves. Uh, I was about to say Udio, but I thought that was kind of funny because there has been a little bit of debate. So now we all know officially. What's the best marketing company to use instead of these fake promotional companies that use bots? Yeah, guys, I mean, you really, for anyone that you hire who has an obligation to get you views, there is always a risk that they have the pressure on themselves and they don't know what the hell that they are about to do as far as paying for fake bots and that it will negatively impact you. They don't even mean to We've get you into trouble. The, and they just give you a little community. boosty boost, little boosty boost, and then you get a notification from Spotify. Hey, fake streaming. You get a notification from DistroKid. Hey, fake streaming. And then you have to contact me and you're like, holy shit, I got locked out of my account. Like it's, it's why I'm just like, you got to take on these obligations yourself to learn how to do this stuff or hire someone to work for you. Eventually, I understand not everyone can do that right away, yeah. but I'm just saying it and just try to maintain control and oversight. So you just know what's going on with your project. So this is from the video that you did talking about your legal battle with DistroKid that you had. Is it possible to transfer over songs from another distributor? Yeah, you got it. And a couple things to keep in mind, okay? If you guys ever jump ship and you're like, I'm, I'm leaving the distributor that I'm with for any reason, okay? You reserve the right to, to do that. Yes, you could change your music over. You'd want to take a peek at the terms of service, okay? And this is something we looked at because we've gone through TuneCore, CD Baby, DistroKid. Mm. And just, you know, what are the restrictions? Because on some of the platforms, we were like shocked to learn that they are non-exclusive. You can terminate at any point. And others are like, we're exclusive. You can't go anywhere. This is the term of the agreement. But, you know, generally speaking, so let's say you issue termination. So I did this for CD Baby. I got a great deal with like a boutique. I pulled my music because I had stuff on like CD Baby and Symphonic and uh, DistroKid. And so I eventually started migrating my catalog. So please keep in mind this. You want to make sure you have your ISRC numbers, which your distributor gives to you. Now, yes, some of you are like, but you can go and get your own code and all this stuff. That's true. Wherever the code is, 99.9% .9 of the time, the distributor just assigned it to your music. So it's in your account. So you just grab that information and you make a note of it. And you're like, this is the song. This is the ISRC. And you keep note of that because you have to pull the music down first. And someone was asking me about this and uh, he's like, ah, I'm having all these problems because I redistributed the music through a different distributor. And now there's two versions. <laughs> when you create conflicts on music platforms, they like their brains explode. They can't handle it. They don't know what to do because it's disputing. So you got to step one, pull down and you have to just try to time it. And like when we're mute, when we're moving catalogs for like the big boy artists out there and we don't want any interruption of distribution because they're making so much money, <laughs> you know, from the streaming. We have to time this and we work together with this distributor and this distributor and all this stuff. When you are your own boss, you got to just time it. And so if CD Baby's like, it's going to take 30 days, but it'll probably be less than that. You just kind of keep an eye on it. And then you push it back up, let's say through DistroKid, if that's what you're doing. When you're uploading it, put in the ISRC numbers, okay? So it will retain all of the streams that it that all your music had received previously. That's how you do it. If you redistribute and you put new ISRC numbers on it, then it's starting from zero. Okay. So feel free to jump ship, you know, as permissible in your, then the contract you signed with your distributor. That would, that, that's my one little note that a lot of artists don't know. So hopefully you'll find that helpful. As you are writing songs and releasing them, you should have some kind of Excel sheet or something like that, keeping track of all of your different ISRC codes, all of your numbers and keep it all in one place so that when you have to look for this stuff, when you are deciding to, to change distributors, which you probably will do. I mean, we've switched distributors 
at least a handful of times now at this point. It is a process and it is something that you have to actively pay attention to. Become your own record label, which is literally if you're like, hey, I want to start a record label. Cool, I got you. Understand the entire music business. I want to set up my LLC. I want to do the marketing. It's a lot. So for example, sync licensing, for example, music marketing, it's significantly cheaper than anything you would ever get from a law firm as far as all the stuff that comes with it. And you want to make six figures from your music career and you want to do this for real. Like I'm going to give you what you need. Here's another one that was also on the Udio video. It's going to take some getting used to. I made a song in Suno that sounds suspiciously like Nickelback. I don't really know any Nickelback. I was worried it was going to sound end up sounding too familiar. Even when being re-recorded, I think the danger is making a song that is too close to a well-known song that you aren't even aware of at all because it may not be in the genre you normally write with. Yeah, so we talked about this on the um, Udio, Udio Exposed video reacting to Jesse's video where he's like, you know, basically he's recreating these hit songs. And you and I were even talking about the, the reaction to the guy who was able to kind of make a Depeche Mode. The Depeche Mode was crazy. Sound alike. And so what we what we just kind of opined on, right, is there just seems to be like artifacts of real stuff in the stuff that's being made by AI platforms. And we just go, we also know that because like I'm friends with people in high places and I also know music distributors and stuff like that. And I could just talk to them and just be like, look, you know, and I asked this before last show and I just go talk to me about the AI created stuff. What do you do and right. how does it work and how do you analyze this stuff? And they go, one of the things we're running into is that the artists who make AI music, they're having content ID issues because content ID is like, hey, there's like, there's stuff in your stuff, in your songs that belongs to other people. But that's not the case. That wasn't supposed to be the case. Right. If you're making something that sounds, what did you say, Nickelback? Yeah, it sounds like Nickelback, but he's not sure. But that's interesting because it's like when you are, let's say, just writing stuff and it sounds like things. And if you don't listen to Nickelback, but you're like, this is a pretty good song. And you didn't realize that it took an album track from a Nickelback song like you wouldn't even know you, like so that's something also that you have to be careful of if you are generating ai songs if you don't know every song that has been released you might not even pick up on some of the things that might yeah, be just straight that's, up that, that's where i was going with it i go you don't know what you don't know and for something you know we have like the taylor swifts of the world who mm. preemptively even when they're right. like hey i wasn't trying to rip off your song they preemptively go and do deals and they're like my song sounds like yours i'm literally just going to give you a little percentage because I don't even want to deal with a copyright infringement claim. And so with the, all of that in mind, especially if you're like, I think it kind of really sounds like, use reasonable judgment is what I would say at this point. Yeah, for sure. Yu-Gi-Oh, I didn't even think about that. That's so funny. It does sound like that. On your publishing video, if I sign up with, say, BMI or ASCAP now after seven years of making and distributing music, what's happened? Do I get dated payments? So like they haven't signed up yet they want to sign up now and they just want to, I, I guess they're looking for some kind of back payments or something for stuff that they had already distributed i've gone over this as far as all the places you want to make sure your music is registered to make sure you get paid all your royalties there's different types of music royalties okay what this person's asking is in regards to performance rights organizations which is in the united states it's bmi it's it's csac it's it's ascap right in different countries different pros so if you, and this happened the last time we tried this, you get paid on a move forward basis, which is why I'm like, hey, like as ASAP, make sure you register your music because you get paid for the composition, the publishing through the PROs, which is totally different than other stuff. That's different than your music distributor. But anyway, so you wanna do it ASAP because it's on a move forward basis, okay? But the one platform where you do get a look back is Sound Exchange, yeah. which collects on the non-interactive streaming for the master. Okay, so that's like Pandora, Sirius XM, happened for me, but I earlier in my career, I hadn't registered my stuff. So when I went and registered it, there was money waiting because they're just an organization that's like collecting on stuff. <laughs> Your top of mind stuff is a Piro. Make sure you register with a Piro. Register with the Sound Exchange, and if you're in, in the United States, register the Mechanical Licensing Collective. When submitting your work to the Copyright Office, do you need to get you need a physical format like a CD, or can you send them a USB copy of your work? You can do a physical format like a USB, but they make it so easy when you're submitting music. They're like, "Hey, upload your MP3, upload your wave." So just do that. I would like to get your opinion on artist freedom using YouTube type beats. YouTube type beats. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. On a, on a non-creative commentary on that, you know, just make sure 
any any beat that you license from someone else, which is what this is going to be. If you license it, you got to just be super clear on like what the terms are, especially with these YouTube guys, because, you know, there's all kinds of content ID issues that come up because they're licensing the same thing to a bunch of other people. Uh, there might be things of renewal. So here's what happens, whether you're getting it directly from John or you're going to BeatStars or whatever. If you are licensing something, that means that you're paying an amount of money for a certain period of time. And they usually say that and you guys miss it. And it says it in the little agreement that you get. And they go, you have a license for, you know, whatever, 10 years. Or it's a, you have it up to 10,000 streams. Or you have a license to make the song or a new song, but you don't get to use it in your videos. So they sneak in this stuff so that they can come and get more money from you later. The best thing that could happen is that your version, the top right. line that you put on it, it goes up and it does really well. And then guess what happens? The producer comes back. Right. So for all these reasons, like I'm not, I look, I get it. Like going and, and, you know, leasing beats, licensing the beats, uh, purchasing stuff, like really the more that you can own it, the better it is. And so that's why even for me, when I was literally 16, I was just like, A, I couldn't find a producer to work with me. <laughs> I didn't know anybody. I moved out to Arizona. But in any case, I just like taught myself music production was the best thing. Like yeah. I was horrible. I was absolutely horrible. And then I got better. And then I did start working with people. And then I got contracts. And then I got everything assigned to myself. So I own everything. And so all those little steps you go through it, but like, just keep that in mind as far as ultimately, what are you trying to do? If you just need a quick little thing to get out there, I get it. You can license something. That's cool. But really think about the longevity and trying to own yeah. everything that you have. Well, as far as like YouTube beats, I like them for great ways for producers to kind of represent themselves, but you want your stuff to be exclusive when you're releasing stuff. You don't want someone to hear your song. They Shazam it and three, you know, some other artist comes up because they're using the same beats. And, and that happens all the time. And when people are just literally just taking YouTube beats and rapping over it, like you're wasting your great lyrics, you're wasting your great melodies because there's a hundred people that have the same song. You want to stand out. I always recommend getting the exclusive license. You don't want anybody else to have your beat. You want to have your beat. But to your point on, you know, when you had to just produce your own stuff, I think every artist, every rapper should know how to use a DAW. Whether or not they decide they want to produce all their own music or not, to know how to record themselves in a DAW, they need to know how they work. There's so many tutorials online for whatever DAW that you need to get you a basic understanding of it or be able to, you know, maybe eventually make your own music yourself and just controlling your own music. If you want to lease a beat real quick, if you want to do covers, if you want to whatever, I say go because the the bigger issue that most people struggle with is just overcoming themselves. They're like, it's sure. not good enough and uh, this and all that. Figure out what you want to do, make a move, and then refine as you go.